All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hope everyone is doing fantastic in these interesting times. But uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about classical machinery and some applications and trends of, of what we're seeing in the industry, as well as what some of you guys might be encountering, whether it's uh, on, a, on a choice to upgrade a machine or redo a machine or looking at different solutions. So we're going to kind of take a very broad few strokes at the classical machinery lineup here and, and talk through some of these different solutions that we've got to offer for all the shops, whether it's big or small. So what you're looking at here is uh, some of the typical tools of the trade, right? If you're a woodworking guy or girl or, or a passionate hobbyist or a full production employee, you're probably going to be pretty familiar with a lot of these tools that you're seeing here put up on the screen. Um, these are low cost, simple solutions. And uh, a lot of them are still very viable for many of your shops, you know, whether you're sanding or cutting or shaping or sizing parts or pieces, or even the shop back vacuum to clean things up at the end of the day, right? So depending on things like jobs, uh, the size of the job, the application of the tool, uh, how much volume you're putting through. Um, some of you may use these tools every day, while others may have completely disregarded these uh, in their production zones for, for more higher throughput items or uh, even more advanced solutions to help you guys optimize. So we're gonna kind of set some of these aside today and, and talk about what some of the next steps for you might be if you're still using some of these today. Uh, how might you be able to grow your business or, or increase your production throughput uh, just by uh, upgrading or, or looking at some maybe more complex solutions, uh, but without breaking the bank and without getting too far uh, into the, the world of, of digital optimization. Um, so don't feel intimidated by the level of equipment you'll see here because as we know, not everyone may be at the stage in their growth or even have processes that warrant such automation and technologies that we might talk about. So some of the questions we, you know, we would like to cover is, is where are you now and how are you gonna get to where you wanna be? What might be uh, an avid solution for you? What might be uh, the ace in the hole that gives you that extra leg up, whether it's against your competitors or whether it's to bring a new process in house so that you can have additional offerings for a wider variety of customers um, so that you can grow your sales and increase your business. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit to get the, uh, to get a little bit of feel for what our audience is, where you guys are at, we've got a few questions for you. So Andrew, if you wouldn't mind queuing up some of the polling here, uh, we're just going to kind of check everyone's pulse and, and see where you guys are at. Um, so the first question I want to understand from some of you folks tuning in now is how many employees does your shop typically have in production at any given time? Right. And I'm not talking about folks necessarily in, in the CAD department who are programming. I'm not really talking about your, uh, your sales force. I'm not really talking about your administrative folks. I want to know how many people you have potentially operating a machine, swinging a hammer, uh, you know, assembling doors, whatever it may be that you guys do, where are, where is your shop currently at as far as production personnel? Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, that's actually a little bit surprising, but, but not, uh, not totally off putting here. So we've got a lot of, uh, a good percentage of people both on the top and bottom rungs here, uh, of kind of their growth cycle. So Fairly many of you are already in some advanced shops that might have a very strong labor force, uh, while others are still, uh, you know, the one, two, three, four, five man shops that are pretty much the heart and soul of some of the American woodworking economy here. Great. Uh, next question I've got for you folks. Uh, which of the following stages best describes where your company is currently at in its growth cycle? So firstly, you know, we're a fairly small shop, mostly labor dependent. Um, those are the guys that, uh, you know, might have a lot of tools, but not necessarily a lot of processes. Um, those are some gentlemen who, uh, some ladies and gentlemen who might have um, a lot of smaller solutions doing a lot of manual hand labor. Um, maybe you guys are a small to medium sized shop looking at new technology to help meet a growing demand. Maybe you're just at that first cusp. Uh, you've been in business for a few years or maybe a few more years, and now you're looking to really take the next step up. Uh, maybe you're a medium-sized shop with several stations of optimization, right? Maybe you've taken uh, a lot of technology and to increase things like material yield or throughput or reduce labor, um, all those sorts of things. Maybe you've taken that into consideration and try to have an efficient shop with maybe less people and more technology, right? 
Okay, small, medium-sized shop looking to grow our demand. Like it. That's a, a perfect, perfect group of mix. Again, we've got people from all over the spectrum here, so it's good to know where some of you guys are at. Next question: What are you guys going to be using for your primary cutting solution? So what is the most reliable cutting tool you've got in your shop? What are you using most of the day? How are you dividing those panels? How are you sizing that lumber? Is it table saws? Is it sliders, beam saw, panel saw? Maybe a CNC or a router, or, or maybe you have a combination of both. Maybe you do a lot of your panel processing on a CNC or router, and for the solid wood side, you use a sliding table saw. You know, it could be any of those combinations. Traditional table saws, like it. Small shop solutions, that is exactly what we're catering to today. And last, last question here, for those of you guys in the solid wood processing, um, I wanna know what kind of lumber you're buying. Um, you may be buying rough lumber, processing everything in house. Uh, you might buy some S2S lumber and process a little bit in house, but you don't necessarily have a joiner or a planer. Uh, maybe you do that and you do have those tools in house, or maybe you're one of those folks that buys completely S4S lumber and you're running it straight into the molder and right out the other side for cross cutting and finishing. Or maybe you outsource those. Excellent. Buying rough lumber and processing everything in house. That's an excellent way to do things. Gives you a lot of great control. Gives you a lot of QC in house that you're able to maintain. Uh, but there's certainly nothing wrong with buying S2, S or S4, S lumber. That's for sure. So here's some of the things that, uh, that you guys might hear when you're talking about classical machinery and, and some smaller shop solutions, right? Things like flexibility, process flow, uh, quality control, consistency. Uh, human and machine interaction, material flow, labor savings, resource allocation, uh, value added, operator friendly, right? What do all these words mean to me as a business owner, as an operator, uh, as an employee or an employer, um, and how these are going to fit into my shop and my business ideology and the way I do things um, could greatly improve uh, uh, your entire business model if you take a lot of these things into consideration. Uh, and, and really have the, really have a great flow for some of the things that you're doing in house. So your typical shop layout, um, you know, if this is, if this screen here is my shop floor, let's say, and my raw materials are coming in at the bottom, what might this typically look like? I mean, when I walk into shops, when I'm traveling all over the, all over the nation here, it's very dependent on a lot of the space you guys have allocated, right? I might not have the ideal shop layout solution because simply put, maybe the first things I bought have stayed in that corner since my shop opened. And as I get new machinery, I put them where they might need to go. So looking at a typical shop layout, we can see um, some of the things that may hinder our processes, right? They're not necessarily wrong, but you know, there may be a better way to do things. So in a typical process, you might see your raw material coming in. And if you're in the solid wood world, you're going directly into perhaps your joiner, right? You're gonna surface that lumber, make sure it's super flat, um, that you have a good side to reference and finish. Then maybe you guys have to take it over to the planer. Now we're gonna get our consistent thickness in the process. After that, uh, maybe we need to rip it down to width. After ripping, we'll go over to our shapers, get that mold or that contour or that profile, that cope and stick that we want. Um, after shaping, over to cross cutting, at cross cutting then uh, once we've sized our lumber accordingly we can go to the sanding process and then from sanding to finishing assembly and back to uh, our entrance or exit for the finished goods to process out to the customer or to our next stage whether it's uh, you know for somebody else now if one of these processes isn't there let's say you don't have finishing in house um, you know maybe you just go right to assembly there so that's completely okay but if you look at this floor diagram pattern, you see all the red lines on where they're going and how much traversing back and forth that my employee might be doing across the shop. Maybe he's doing this with a, with a high-low, right? He's driving his forklift all over the shop. Every time I'm getting a touch on that workpiece, it's costing me money. 
it's, I have the probability of damaging something, right? We, we never want to assume that our, our workers can drop a piece or, or mishandle something, but accidents happen as we all know. So taking some of that movement out of there or, or optimizing the process flow inside your shop could end up saving you a lot more time and money than you think and improve the process on the throughput going out. Plus, it'll also help you identify where some of your bottlenecks might be in your production flow, right? If you've got organized chaos, which I'll call this right now, right? I have my specific station for joining. I have my assembly planned out. I have all the tools I need in that location so that my employees can work efficiently to complete my product. But what does that mean for me if I have to take 150 more steps in a day or I have to walk three more laps around the shop to go from planing to shaping to sanding and back again? Um, or what, what, what might this look like if I could optimize this process in house, right? The whole process, not just my planing process, not just my ripping process, but the entire production flow. What might that look like if you were more in an assembly line fashion, right? So now looking at something like this, if I was planning a shop from, let's say ground up, I could start from joining, planing, ripping, shaping, cross cutting, sanding, finishing assembly, and boom back out the door again. Now you see this kind of flow of material of goods. It makes things, frankly speaking, simpler because every process has its dedicated station, but now I can move in a more linear flow, right? I can get less touches on the workpiece. Maybe I can have roller tables in between some of these stations to easily transmit or transport my goods from one station to another. Um, or uh, maybe I just have the high low still driving, but instead of having to go between here, between there and maybe bumping a bunk of lumper up against a table and damaging some stuff, I can have less touches in a more organized fashion and in a more organized flow to be efficient. Plus, if I have this bird's eye view of my shop and you're watching, let's say your production on any given day, this will be a very good telltale sign of where one station might be lacking and where another might be overcompensating for it based on the amount of goods piled up in front of each production cell, right? If I've got my joining, my planing, my ripping, and all of a sudden uh, my cross cutting guy is just sitting around twiddling his thumbs and I look at my shaping station and realize there's a whole bunch of lumber there. Maybe one thing I need to optimize or improve upon is my shaping processes because that's where I'm keeping my time up. So I've got employees down the chain, right? Which are standing around uh, maybe in the sanding and finishing world because I can't cross cut fast enough or because I can't shape fast enough. So being able to look at each process, how it affects the entire flow of goods and then improve upon each one specifically, you can also hone in first and say, where's my bang for buck gonna be first? If I'm slow in sanding, maybe the first thing I do is buy a sander because from joining to planing to ripping to shaping, I need to increase my sanding capacity because that's where I'm getting held up before the finish and assembly. And I don't want anybody standing around, that's money lost versus money gained. So I can easily identify my bottleneck. I can easily talk about what might be able to help me get over this bottleneck, increase my throughput, whether it's a new machine or adapting the process, what I'm currently using to see how I might be able to better this flow and keep goods flowing in and out of your door all the time, right? The more you can produce, the more orders you can take in, the more orders you can take in, the more money you can get uh, as a business. So this is pretty simple math when you're talking about input and output, making sure each station is equal and that everything has its, its fair share of workload at all the time. I don't want to see any of these stations down at any given time if I'm running a fluid process like this. Now, I might not always be joining. I might not always be ripping. I may have three or four employees that can bounce between all of these stations rather than having a dedicated employee at each station, right? Just because I have uh, one of these stations here doesn't mean somebody needs to be working at it all the time. That's going to be dependent on your volume, how big the job is, and what my process might look like. But in order to kind of reduce the touches, improve my material flow, and frankly, make interior logistics that much more simple, having something like this might be a great idea to optimize your shop on the internal side. Now, I'm not saying everyone should... Uh, unplug all of their machines and start moving them around their shop instantaneously. But the next time you're thinking about upgrading to a different solution, instead of just throwing your sander in the corner, because that's where you have space for it, maybe it is time to think about, hmm, if I move this machine here and this machine here, I can make a logical linear flow between my processes, improve my throughput, 
have my employees working more efficiently, taking less steps in the day. It's easier on them and, and we can put more product out the door, whether it's a drawer or a cabinet or a chair, it doesn't matter at all, right? Improving your internal processes will greatly help you improve your output. So talking about some of these processes in a slower or, or in a more uh, magnifying glass fashion, right? Our first process here is jointing. What are we seeing in the joining world? Well, joining is probably one of the most important things if you're working with solid wood, as many of you guys will know, if you don't have a flat surface to reference on, uh, to reference off of, it's gonna make subsequent machining much more difficult. You're not gonna be able to get the same molding quality out of your molder if I don't have a blank set in there that's flat. So whether it's bowed, crooked, kinked, cupped, or twisted, uh, a joiner might be an excellent way uh, to help alleviate defects down the line by just starting right. You know, it's really hard to get a bow out if you've already sanded your piece, you've spent all that time and energy investing into already uh, producing that lumber to a certain extent. Now I have to go back and redo the whole process. That's just rework that I don't necessarily wanna have to do. It costs me time, it costs me money, and it costs me labor. That's coming out of my bottom line for every job. So instead of the profit margin that I think I calculated, I'm actually making something lower because of the subsequent machining I've had to use. Um, also here is, is you can get more control in house with joining and planing. Uh, many of you guys said uh, you're already buying your lumber rough. Um, so at that point, my question is, you know, how, how rough is it? Am I doing uh, for the guys that buy S4S or S2S, is this something I could think about adding control, getting more yield out of the lumber I buy? spending less money on lumber and material in general and have uh, higher control, higher quality, because I'm now bringing this process in-house, right? Maybe I'm using a dual surface planer, uh, which you see in the lower left-hand corner, uh, to kind of do some of the jointing and planing simultaneously. If I'm in the flooring world, that might be a, a great application for that. But maybe I'm just uh, building standard boxes and I would rather pay less money for my rough sawn lumber and process it however I see fit, uh, rather than pay a premium for S4S and S2S, right? Some of the advantages there can be definitely cost-based and can help you increase your bottom lines just because you're paying less for the material. And these machines might pay for themselves in a shorter time than you think, right? And it's not that I need more employees to run those processes. It's just that I can maintain higher control of my output, the quality of my goods. So I don't need to hire a new person to joint all my lumber now. Maybe I'm just joining all my lumber and the money that I saved from buying that lumber is worth the extra man hours in the week because now I have better control, better yield, and maybe I can charge less for my product and be more competitive because now I have control over my internal processes. Or maybe I can buy uh, cheaper lumber and sell at a premium for some of our more expensive exotic hardwoods because now I have that process in house that I can maintain full control. And rather than buying cherry or, or you know, purple heart, whatever it may be, uh, you can get the cheaper stuff and process it however you see fit. Moving on to our planing, right? A lot of these applications here for thickness planing, um, whether it's single-sided or dual surface planing, you know, that really depends uh, on, on a number of factors, but our applications for planing are, are pretty simple, right? Once we've joined, we've got our flat surface, we really wanna take it and get a consistent thickness. Uh, we see some of these in flooring mills, lumber mills, architectural millwork, pallet manufacturing, all very important to have a steady, accurate and consistent planing process so that my, my input is my output and those things stay equal every single time and I'm getting good quality results, right? So what are we seeing in some of the industry trends for, for planers? Uh, helical versus straight knife has always been, uh, has always been a, an argument that's been had, right? I've got many customers who prefer straight knife just because that's the way they've been doing it. And their Oliver planer from 1926 still runs, so they never thought about changing anything. Um, we've got some folks who also prefer tersa heads, right? There might not be a wrong or a right way to do this. And based on you know, what species wood you're cutting, or how, at what speeds you need to cut or what quality finish you're looking for, some of these solutions might be more geared towards you. But I'll tell you from our line of planers, we see that a lot of things are moving towards that helical cutting head, right? For a couple of reasons. One, you need less horsepower needed because I'm driving 100 tiny knives versus four large blades. So instead of this giant ax swing motion I have to 
throw at it. I'm getting a bunch of little chops and chips. Um, so I don't need as much power in order to shave uh, that stock off than I did if I had uh, maybe two or four blades on a straight knife that I had to drive through that workpiece. Um, another thing, cheaper tooling, right? I can get carbide inserts for a couple bucks a piece and then I can recycle the carbide and get money back after that. If you're not recycling your carbide right now, you need to think about doing that because that'll help you save money on your tooling in the long run. And carbide is expensive. I mean, it might be cheap to buy a knife, but knives after knives after knives, uh, it's something that adds up. And if you can take that in and recycle it somewhere locally, uh, you can definitely get some cash back for that. And then damaging a carbide insert. I can, if I accidentally have a nail in one of the, the rough sawn boards that I got or a staple or whatever it may be, I go that, I go through that with a straight knife. I'm talking about maybe a four or $500 knife, potentially even more expensive, right? Now I have to go get that sharpened. That knife is gonna be shorter than the other three in the set. Uh, so now I have to get all four of them sharpened so that they're still the same distance versus just a two-sided insert that I can literally throw away and for a couple of bucks, recycle that and throw a new one in there in a few seconds. And I don't have to worry about damaging expensive tools, uh, any imperfections. I can also get more stock removal because I have so many knives working together, right? Many hands make light work. That works. That uh, metaphor is exactly true in planing as well. I've got almost a hundred knives on some of my cutter heads uh, that all work together to remove that stock. And they're removing it quieter than your straight knives, right? Not just because I have a smaller horsepower motor in there because I don't need to overpower a machine to drive those big knives but also the sounds a helical cutter head makes, those smaller chips being removed. It's not as aggressive and it's not as uh, loud as when a straight knife flies through it. A couple of things we use as well in, on the four-sided versus two-sided knives conversation. I've got plenty of machines in the field uh, that use four-sided knives and we've chosen to use two-sided knives for a couple of reasons. One, um, I can get a better blended finish off my two-sided knives. They're a little bit wider and also the edges are beveled back at about five degrees. So the edge of my knives typically isn't really making contact with the workpiece, just the center part. So I'm getting a nice clean shave versus a heavy chop. So I'm removing some of the knife marks. Now you'll still see knife marks in all planing applications, but I won't have those edges touching the, the workpiece as much and I'll get a little bit less knife mark, which will give me a better blended finish. Also on a four-sided knife, those things are sharpened to a corner, right? That's always the first spot we see break on a four-sided knife. So those weak edges instantaneously, no, I don't want to say instantaneously, but over time, those weak edges are the first spot that breaks. And once you see that break, it's basically quite apparent once your board piece comes out, oh, okay, I got a knife there. You open the sucker up, turn it, um, and you have a lot more knives because of those four-sided knives are typically smaller, maybe 12 or 14 millimeters. Um, but our two-sided knives are 30 millimeters long, so I don't have to have as much tools per head. Now, I said I have 100 knives. If you're using four-sided knives, that might be 150, right, or even greater. So recognizing that tooling changes take time and trying to minimize that, but also still keeping a good cut with a strong knife uh, is really important for us. So that's why we use a lot of the two-sided knives on pretty much all of our joinering and planing applications, as well as in our planer sander helical heads. And another thing that, uh, that's been becoming more and more popular that uh, we actually, I am a big fan of this feature, especially in our dual sided planer, uh, is a carpet fed system. So what this means is there is a, a bunch of spring fed pressure fingers, right? If you can envision that as your workpiece flows into the machine, these pressure fingers all grab onto the workpiece at different times and different pressure points. So for us, this means that I'm really getting a consistent hold down because as I pull my piece through my planing process, it's not one bed roller, right? That I might be pressing down on the left side of my workpiece, but because I have some varying thickness and some of this rough sawn lumber, I might have jointed one side and now I just want to run it through my planer. Well, maybe it's 15 millimeters thick on the left side of the board and 13 millimeters thick on the right side of the board. If I had a bed roller pressure system, I would just push down on that 15 millimeter side because that's where we would come in contact with it. With my carpet fed, because each of these fingers are spring loaded, I can literally grab my entire workpiece simultaneously 
because those springs will adjust for varying thicknesses inside the machine. And I'll be able to maintain a consistent hold down so that there's no movement inside the workpiece, nothing shaking around or chattering as it goes through the planing process. Because once that cutter head hits it, if there's any space for that workpiece to vibrate and lift up and down off the table, it sure as heck might. And that would be terrible for our finish quality when it comes out. You're going to have all sorts of marks in that that are completely undesirable. So maintaining a constant hold down through the planing process is very important for having good quality results. Moving on to our ripping applications. Rip saw is, is, is as basic as a table saw, perhaps a slider that you're using for ripping, right? But what might be some of the disadvantages of that versus uh, using a straight line rip? Now, if I've actually got volume and I'm using a straight line rip saw, uh, some of the important things to, to keep in mind are, you know, I'm doing straight line rips here. Uh, maybe I'm doing some glue line lips, sizing my lumber, cutting up molding blanks or glue up blanks. Uh, could be any of those applications that you're using on a rip saw. But what kind of advantages does a dedicated rip saw give to me? So in that, <clears throat> my biggest thing is safety, right? When, we, when you think about all those buzzwords you saw back in the first couple slides, safety was definitely on there. And safety for us is very important. And a rip saw can be a dangerous machine, almost as dangerous as licking the shelves in a Walmart. So for this, we really want to take safety into consideration, right? we have extended anti-kickback fingers so that no, uh, well, I, sh I shouldn't say so that no, so that a very minimal amount of kickback can occur. And if it does occur, we have plenty of catches or plenty of areas to catch it with our three or four sets of anti-kickback fingers, both on the bottom and on the top of the table. So in the first picture on the bottom left, you'll see our anti-kickback curtain go all the way down to the table, right? There's hardly a millimeter in between that table and that curtain. If you're buying a rip saw, that's something you want to look for. I cannot express how many injuries that we've heard of in the last year from improper rip saw use. You've either tightened the pressure down too much and it threw the workpiece back at you, or a splinter chipped off, and because there wasn't ample kickback in there, a piece flew backwards, and heaven forbid it hits an operator or somebody else walking by. Uh, frankly speaking, we all want to have safe shops, and having those risks just isn't worth it, right? So when you're looking at a new rip saw or a dedicated rip saw, make sure it's got good anti-kickback fingers. Make sure that those extend far left and right of the chain feed and come completely down to the table or up above the cutting line, right? You don't want any chances of material flying through those or underneath those or around those. We want that to be the barrier blockade of safety. So our chain fed rip saws, you know, whether it's a single blade system or working your way into a multi-blade rip saw on a fixed arbor or perhaps movable blades with laser guidelines, safety always plays the key. Um, and having that laser there allows you to defect as well right on the spot. Now, it might not be as sophisticated as some of our other solutions that will automatically scan boards for pencil marks or for knots or whatever it may be. But if I have an operator line up a board on a rip and he sees the laser line, all I have to do is train that operator to look for certain things that might be weak spots in the board or a knot that you don't want to have because you're looking for pure, high quali higher quality lumber. Or maybe we want the knot in there because somebody's looking for a more vintage type solution, right? As that, those trends kind of change in the industry and what everybody's looking for, whether it's on a cabinet or a solid wood piece, uh, preference has always been in the eye of the beholder. So we've got plenty of people who might desire that uh, defected lumber, even though we look at it as a defect in the woodworking industry, that might be something that people are desiring to see, right? And we talked about that in profiling in uh, Sanding to Improve Your Bottom Line the other day with Aaron and Addison. If you didn't watch that presentation, I strongly recommend you check it out uh, because they talked about the similar things with sanding, right? How do we make cool things look vintage or somebody wants this old barnyard look? How do I achieve that? Some of it might be in the base process of just defecting your lumber to say, I want that knot in or I don't want that knot in. How do I adjust this so that I can get my ripped width but still have the best quality lumber or the right quality lumber for the job? On to shaping and molding, right? Our next station is obvious. What are we doing with our shaping and molders? Typical joinery, tongue and grooves, cope and sticks, maybe your dovetailing for your drawer boxes. Uh, you could be edge profiling and cleaning. Uh, we can also use larger cutters for profiles uh, than routers can, so we can remove much more stock if needed. 
um, and then raised panel doors as well, another popular one in shaping and molding. So <clears throat> this might be another great spot for you to think about, you know, adding, let's say capacity or everyone has three or four shapers in a little concentrated station in their shop and one of them set up for a coping stick, one of them set up for a tongue and groove, and the other one set up for a dovetail, and I don't touch those guys unless I'm doing exactly that process. Well, that's floor space, that's machinery that we might not necessarily need, right? So even thinking about optimizing on the most basic level, does a shaper that, have, that has the capability to do stacked tooling so that I don't have to have three, four, or five shapers set up for each individual process. Maybe I can get rid of two of those shapers, save myself a considerable amount of floor space for something else. And in addition, I can have uh, maybe motorized rise, fall, and tilt for my spindle so that I can lock in to certain toolings and cutter heads. I can just release a spindle uh, with HSK and I can pop a new spindle on and go to tool B. And in 120 seconds or less, I'm completely set up for my next profile and my next job, right? Cutting down on those tool changes, cutting down on setup times, right? Keeping things safe. We're gonna talk about safety. You're gonna see safety all over this presentation because frankly speaking, with a lot of these classical woodworking machines, safety is always our biggest concern. We've got high spinning cutter heads that are open, right? We've got blades that might be exposed on a table saw or a slider. So we wanna address that because that's obviously a really big thing for us. And we want to make sure that all the shops and all the operators stay safe. Nobody wants to experience an accident, right? So safety and shapers is important as well. Guards, fences, clamps, uh, sliding table attachments with another clamps on them too. So you're looking at that here on the, on the top, uh, on the right picture, actually. That's a uh, miter gauge clamp that slides into the T-slot on top of the shaper. And I can clamp my part down and run it through the, the cutter head with keeping my fingers 12 to 14 inches away from the cutter, right? I can adjust my cut quality for speed and feed to make sure that I can get the, you know, make sure I can reduce blowout to make sure I'm getting the profile I want. And in my stock removal, I can, I can improve that as well because now I can have larger cutter profiles, right? As, and a basic shaper might be, you know, your gateway into a molder. I might start doing my profiles here, um, do some very simple molding and realize oh, wow, I just created a niche for my shop. Now I have the capability of doing uh, new profiles and accessing new customers. Maybe in a year or two, I might want to think about getting a molder. Or maybe I've already done that. Maybe I want to think about getting a molder now that's like four or five head because I can't keep up on my shapers, right? So when you talk about improving each individual process, it might not necessarily be, um, you know, a, a art of buying the latest and greatest and biggest and best technology, it might be something as simple as stack tooling or motorized axes on a CNC uh, fence that could help me adjust and set up quicker. Shaving those seconds off my, pro off my production time is dollars and cents for you down the road. When I talk about cross cutting, um, you know, here we're seeing uh, a, a lot of good trends moving towards optimized solutions, you know. Uh, with me today as well is Gordon Belt, so he'll help me field some questions at the end of this. Um, but if you guys didn't watch his presentation on understanding the value of an optimizing chop saw, that was on okay. Tuesday. I'm going to oh, have to step up just for a second. Sure. Thank but you. Thank you. No, I'm here. Oh, okay. Understanding the value of an optimizing chop saw was an excellent presentation with Gordon, right? We're talking about taking a simplified chop saw and then adding maybe a little bit of technology to make it that much more accurate, that much more safe, that much more efficient and increase our cut quality, you know, tenfold. So having some of these repeatable things and these through flow processes are fantastic when you're thinking about optimizing a single station, right? Now, does a manual scale and a chop saw work? Absolutely. But how safe is that at the end of the day? I've got that exposed blade. If my operator's not paying attention because he's tired at the end of the day, I see a lot of accidents happen on chop saws and especially on radial arm saws where people are manually pulling through the material or manually pushing the saw blade down through the material, right? Substituting that with an upcut saw, with a chop saw, with, a, with an enclosed blade, with guards that hold it down, 
uh, you know, where it's nearly impossible to get your hand even near the cutting line and the machine takes care of everything itself. That's a huge improvement for these people, not to mention the cut quality and the accuracy of having something like a tiger stop added onto it, right? Which gives me the ability uh, to push or to use it as a stop, as a motorized stop. How many times do people say, uh, what is it? Cut twice or measure twice and cut once. Some guys are measuring three or four times and cutting once. Some guys might measure one time and cut once and realize they cut it wrong. Well, if we can pull that error out of it, if we can take human error out of the equation, we can increase our throughput, we can do our jobs faster, more efficiently, and more accurately with simplified solutions, right? This is not rocket science. We're talking about chop saws here. But having a basic motorized positioner, which is a very low cost of investment compared to some of uh, the other high duty solutions you can get, can give us great paybacks on it for our kitchen cabinets, for our furniture components, pallet manufacturing, as well as in flooring, right? Even then, with these automized pushers, we can do some defecting, you know? And Gordon went through that very well in his presentation. So I really, if you guys are on the higher level of optimizing in the crosscut world, I strongly recommend uh, looking at his presentation uh, if you hadn't tuned in already. That was on Tuesday. So again, chop saws, maintaining safety, keeping things simple, but also eliminating human error, right? It's gonna increase our throughput. It's gonna help us get better, help us make more money, help us work more efficiently in the workplace. Talking about sanding as well. Uh, I'm not gonna spend as much on sanding here because uh, yesterday there was a fantastic presentation by Aaron Brink and Addison Fox, sanding to improve your bottom line. I also recommend watching that. There is a ridiculous amount of information packed into that presentation. And even as a sanding guy myself, I still constantly learn from those two gentlemen and their wealth of knowledge in the sanding world. So check out sanding to improve your bottom line. I guarantee you, you will learn something. Um, excellent resources from those two gentlemen. But industry trends, as always, we see a lot of hand sanding everywhere, right? It's costly, it's inconsistent, takes time and labor. And I could have anywhere from one to four people doing that on a daily basis. I'm not saying fire your hand sanders and buy a better machine. I'm saying if you had a better machine and you could repurpose the current work staff you have, maybe I don't need to spend as much time on hand sanding and I can have these other gentlemen do my joining and planing process, or I could have them out installing, or, hey, I've got a good guy. I'm going to teach him how to do job estimates so that myself as a business owner doesn't have to go from customer to customer to customer to customer and run around every day. I can spend a little bit more time managing my shop as well. So being able to take the resources you have and reshuffle that deck might be all the optimization you need in order to say, now I don't have to spend 15, 16, 45 hours a week hand sanding because I have the right machine for the right job and I can utilize my people more efficiently in order to have my process flow as a whole be more lucrative and be more fluid. Um, so from the Ironwood line of things, we're looking at mostly solid wood and calibration sanders. Uh, Texturing, sealer sanding as well is, is also, you know, in our, some of our more advanced home ag and Hesemann solutions. But here, typically, you know, we're using uh, for the calibration machines, like the boys mentioned yesterday, we're using drums and pads. Very simple, very easy to use. Again, this is not rocket science. We're just thinking here, if I have a certain grid sequence I need to follow, how could I establish that uh, in a, in a process flow way so that I can decrease my time and increase my throughput, right? So talking about uh, solid wood a lot has also got me thinking about, you know, some cut band bore production flows. So your production flow for cut band bore, obviously a little bit simpler. Some of our closet or cabinet folks or even uh, very simple uh, storage guys might only need a few machines to complete their tasks, to complete uh, whatever finished product and good they're trying to, to build or produce, right? So for this, uh, very interesting to see how, you know, an easy slider, a simple bander, and a manual boring machine with super manual assembly and hammering your dowels in, right? That might be the way you start. Now from here, that slider could very easily be a more advanced slider, or it could be a panel saw. That bander could be 
you know, 10 feet long or 20 meters long. It just depends on your volume. And that little manual boring machine could easily be some of the, dr the drill tech 500s, um, you know, that Scott was talking about in small batch production and whether or not it's right for you. So being able to substitute some of these machines in and out um, is an easy way to grow your throughput, right? But once I establish my production flow, now I can see quite clear where my bottlenecks are, where my material's being hung up, and going from A to B rather than A to C to B to D, I have a more concise flow, I have a logical layout for my production, and I can work as efficiently as possible given the space and given uh, the tools that I have to complete the job. Talking about cutting efficiency too, right? A lot of you folks uh, looking back here, let's say 33% uh, of you mostly use table saws and sliding table saws. And then we had a good mix of folks that used uh, beam saws, panel saws, CNC's or routers, right? The industry trends we see, it's actually quite funny because when you talk about woodworking on a global scale between uh, Europe and the United States, for instance, we have a lot more table saws here. Uh, being a sliding table saw product specialist, I have quite the biased opinion of saying that every shop absolutely should have a slider. And I don't understand why people think table saws are still a viable means to cut lumber. But truth is, they're super cheap and basically you can acquire them anywhere, right? But what we always see and quite an argument that people always, you know, send towards me is, man, this is this is impossible to cut a four by eight sheet on a table saw, or it requires a lot of work. I can't just put anybody on that saw. They have to be able to physically have uh, the brawn to push that entire panel through the cut, right? You're talking about workpiece maneuverability. You're talking about setup times, putting that rip fence in the right location and making sure those cheap dinky rim fences on some of the table saws out there aren't swaying. They don't have play in them, right? You're talking about accuracy, efficiency, cut quality, and then, for me, safety again, right? Those table saws have uh, an exposed blade. Now there's a lot of technology out there coming out uh, or has been out for a while to help reduce accidents in the table saw world. But at the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of those are reactionary. They're not preventative. And by that, I mean, uh, the machine is reacting to an error the operator made in order to save a finger or a hand, right? From a sliding table saw perspective, we're taking safety first and trying to prevent the accident from even happening, right? With a saw stop, if I shove my finger in the blade, hopefully it retracts fast enough to not cut any of my skin. But with a sliding table saw, I'm removing my hands from the blade area entirely, right? So my chance of having an injury and accidentally slipping into the cutting zone is far reduced just based on how the machine's set up where I can support my work pieces, how I can clamp them down, and what kind of cuts I'm doing to help assist in order to keep your operator's fingers in a completely safe space, not to mention having dedicated blade guards, not only for extraction, but for also safety. So these are really important things to kind of look at while you're doing this, right? When you talk about workpiece maneuverability, I have a sliding table saw that's basically moving back and forth on a train track, completely vertical distribution of the weight. If you, none of you guys have ever experienced pushing a panel through a sliding table saw, I strongly recommend you find one of the shops close to you that has a sliding table saw and just try it. It is not only a thousand times easier, but it's way more accurate and you get a much better finish based on just the simple fact that I only need to traverse straight and straight back again, right? I'm eliminating operator error. I'm increasing my throughput. I'm able to produce more panels and make more cuts more accurately, reducing the amount of rework, right? If I'm trying to do an eight foot, uh, if I'm trying to take my eight foot sheet and cut it right in half because I've got some closet sides to make, what if I accidentally move a little bit left or a little bit right uh, while I'm cutting down the path with my table saw? If I have a little bit of variation in that, it's gonna throw out the rest of my box entirely. So when I put all four sides together, it's not gonna fit right and you're gonna to have to redo it. So eliminating that need for rework again, just chipping away at my bottom line, costing me more money, costing me more time. The job that I quoted is not making as much money as I originally thought because I have to go recut, I have to go rework and I have to go reproduce. That's just all time that we can help save and we can give more uh, 
more bang for the buck out of having some of those, right? So applications here for the sliding table saw world, um, even in some of our advanced sliders, panel divided, ripping, straight line ripping, cross cutting. I can do miters and compound miters, sizing, trimming, and edge cleaning. For those of you guys who have CNC routers and, um, and uh, you know, bigger panel or beam saws, are you going to want to program uh, an entire cut list just to get one part out if you forgot to do one or heaven forbid someone drops a part on the shop floor and I need to reproduce something. I see a lot of sliding table saws used in ancillary or complementary ways as well, or even in prototype locations in the shop, right? I need to do a one-off. I don't want to have to go through the whole uh, hassle of getting my CNC guy to program this one specific piece of cabinetry uh, because my customer has a really weird shaped kitchen. I'd rather just go cut it out on the slider and let my CNC run all day long, right? Anytime I stop that sucker from making me money, it's costing me money. So if I can keep some of my dedicated cutting machines running and fed, and I don't have to do some of the small one-offs with them, something like a slider comes in like a Swiss army knife and can be an excellent tool to add versatility um, in cutting solutions and give, give your CNCs and routers time to do all the big parts and all of the mass production, right? Keep those suckers running and I can do my one-offs on the sliders. So to kind of uh, summarize up a little bit, size does not necessarily matter when you're talking about some of these solutions, right? Different shops require different solutions. Floor space, having efficient layouts are possible regardless of the size of your shop and can greatly increase the amount of goods you can produce in a shop using the tools you might already have and based on production capacity, right? When growth occurs, you wanna have the tools you need to facilitate that growth. You know, when I notice my bottlenecks happening, I might say, man, I got this big job coming up, and if I keep this station of shapers right here, or if I keep my current uh, ripping solution with table saws, there's absolutely no way I am gonna meet my deadlines to build 100 boxes or 1,000 boxes or even 10 boxes, depending on the size of your shop. So being able to recognize where the fault might lie, right, to improve one specific piece of the component. As, as they say, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So recognizing where that weakest link is, is going to give me uh, the telltale sign of where I need to improve, of where I need to optimize, of where I might need to invest, whether it's, whether it's time or whether it's capital, right? So classical machinery can progress from core to complementary equipment. A lot of these machines, just like some of the tools we looked at on the second slide, are very simple machines. They don't do anything crazy special, right? But it could be that next step up to get you towards that molder, to get you towards that CNC, to get you towards that big beam saw. If you're doing things on table saws right now but can't quite justify buying a big beam saw, maybe you wanna think about a slider uh, because that might be the next stepping stone into, okay, I'm increasing my production, I'm increasing my quality, I'm increasing my accuracy, decreasing my cost of doing business and now I'm making more money. Now I can justify the next investment. Now I can justify moving up. Now I can take on more work and more orders because I have the capacity to do so, right? Productivity can be sustained with the right tools and the right atmosphere. You can continue growth in a healthy curve and continue to support that growth once it's, it's occurred and then achieve even higher results after the fact. So from this, I want to encourage everyone to connect with us uh, on our social media sites, uh, whether it's on Ironwood's Facebook page, Styles LinkedIn, Styles Facebook, and Styles Instagram. We're constantly posting content there, uh, whether it's tips and tricks for trades from CNC tooling to uh, simple planing solutions or you know what a sliding table saw can do for you. Um, a lot of the uh, product specialists and product folks in our team are always putting stuff out there. So if you're interested in the woodworking side of things, I strongly recommend you follow those sites. There's a ton of good information out there and it also gives you a great way to interact with some of our product specialists and ask questions about anything you might've seen. So feel free to like, follow and subscribe to all of those sites. Um, everything will be posted there that you pretty much see as well. And uh, that concludes uh, the classical machinery portion of my presentation. So I'd like to field any questions now if folks have had